The, the last question is, it brings up a, a, a great musician, Glenn Gould. He had a presentation. Uh, maybe it was polemic intended, or maybe it was just meant to be kind of thought-provoking. It was how Mozart became a bad composer. And But the, the point I think he was trying to make there is, on an aesthetic level, do you lose your creativity when you are just mimicking patterns? And then someone like Beethoven doesn't seem to have that problem. So... How would someone trained in Partimento deal with the issue of being overwhelmed by cliches? Ah, yes. Well, Glenn Gould um, made a, a, an amazing career out of being exceptional and um, by design, I think. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a second recording, a much later recording of the Goldberg variations by him in which he had a theory about a kind of... Uh, whole number temporal proportions between the different tempi in the movements. And, and I think the general feeling is that that is a worse <laughs> performance <laughs> than when he just, when he just did it uh, on whatever occurred to him at the moment. Creativity is, I, I think not what a lot of people think it is. Uh, creativity and originality. These are, very confused terms and I suppose I could start by saying it's all cliches <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what people think isn't a cliche is something where they haven't heard enough of that kind of thing all right I mean for example mid 20th century avant-garde 12 tone music Every piece was considered to be completely original. <laughs> but at 60 or 70 years distance, <laughs> if you listen to 20 of those pieces, you'll think to yourself, this is the most God-awful, <laughs> cliche-ridden stuff I've ever heard. Okay. This is why I, I like construction grammar so much. In other words... Almost everything we say is based on other things we've heard other people say or that we've said ourselves. I mean, linguists have done studies of this and they find 50, 60, 70 percent of what people say in conversation is actually a prefab, a prefabricated construction, something that they just pull out of the air because it fits the situation, you know. A lot of the creativity is how you put things together. Take the blues, for example. You know, a great blues guitar, electric guitar player like B.B. King played the blues every day of his life, <laughs> practically. Okay. And would you say that he was not creative because he always played the blues? Well, certainly not. Well, that, that's not tenable. He was creative but he was working inside a tradition and that tradition required a lot of things to be similar to other things. Uh, Beethoven, for example, gets more schematic the older he gets. You know, the, the really wild stuff in his late works are strangely enough schematically more cliched than uh, in the middle of his life. You know, the uh, late, oh, I, it might be Opus 109. I'm terrible with those kind of numbers. <laughs> but it begins with a Roman, uh, it begins with a Romanesca. It goes, like that. It's a Romanesca. And then it's followed by a big swoop across the, the register, and it's a fonte. Now, that's not where you put a fonte in the world of Haydn and Mozart. But there it is. It's this huge piece. Tempo breaks. Uh, it's really strange. But the strangeness is in how he's moved around these conventional cliched blocks of material. It's not in the choice of the material. And, you know, Think about literature or the movies, for example. 
you know, is it fair to say that a director uh, has no creativity because this movie is Boy Meets Girl and they fall in love? Well, that's not fair to the director. <laughs> okay. Every third movie is about that. Uh, so the fact that you make a movie where a boy meets a girl and they fall in love, uh, and of course they have some disputes and they fall out, but it's happy in the end and, and they kiss in the last scene. That's not where creativity and originality come into play. If you don't use material that the audience already knows something about, or at least recognizes, how can you communicate? You know, when we talk about uh, literature, somebody could made up, make up their own language and write a story in that language. And it, you could say, well, that's original, but no one else could read it. <laughs> right. Right? Yep. And think of all the original music that has littered the 20th century. Uh, <laughs> no one will ever hear again. <laughs> well, you know, the idea was that you had to have an original kind of music. It wasn't just enough to, to work with conventional materials, the music itself had to be totally original. And the audience sat there and they thought, well, this is interesting. And they collapsed politely at the end, but no one ever said, I want to hear that again. <laughs> There's a story of Stokowski, who was a, you know, a, a, a kind of advanced music advocate when he was conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And they played a piece by, <laughs> now, this is in the 1930s, and modern at that time may have meant Rachmaninoff, but it could have been also something you know more more 20th century style. Anyway, when they finished, uh, about four people in the audience clapped quietly, and Stokowski turned around and said, "Ah, you like it so much. <laughs> we'll play it again." <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, 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 th that kind of music has had a difficult life with audiences. It certainly has. <laughs>